If you need help understanding how to order new custom printed circuit boards from a manufacturer, then in this video, I'm going to show you step by step exactly how to do it. Ordering boards can be a rather overwhelming process the first time you do it because there are just so many complex specifications required. I'm going to show you how to order boards from a PCB manufacturer named Bidley. And Bidley is headquartered in Canada, but they do most of their manufacturing in China. By ordering boards from a Chinese supplier, you're going to save a ton of money, especially compared to a U.S. manufacturer. And although I'm showing you how to order boards from Bidley, I also recommend two other Chinese suppliers named Seed Studio and PCB Way. But regardless of where you order the boards from, the specifications required are pretty much identical. So once you complete this video, you'll have the necessary knowledge to order boards from any vendor. Hi, I'm John Teal. I'm a former microchip design engineer and an entrepreneur who brought my own product to market, which was sold in hundreds of retail stores. Now I help other entrepreneurs and startups bring their new electronic products to market. Before I get started, I just want to quickly let you know that I've created a handy PDF cheat sheet that you can download to help guide you through all of the specifications discussed in this video for ordering custom boards. Just go to predictabledesigns.com forward slash order PCB or see the link in the description below. Okay, let's get started. To get started with a quote on a Bidly, you're, you start on their homepage and then you go under here and you're going to start a new project and I'm just going to... Name this Hardware Academy. I'm just gonna say order a quantity of five. I'm gonna turn off parts procurement. I'm not gonna upload the BOM and that's where you need to do that. So I'm gonna just skip that step for this. So just quick little overview of their process. It starts off with the PCB specifications. Bidly allows you to enter units in inches or millimeters. It's a little misleading because even if you choose metric, then some of the certain things like a trace width and minimum trace spacing tend to be given in English units or mils, which are a thousandth of an inch. I'm going to keep this in inches for this case here. Let's just do a board where I'm just going to do one inch by one inch. Quantity is self-explanatory. This is the thickness of the entire board and 0.062 is the most standard size, which is 1.6 millimeters is what that would be in the metric, let's say, yeah. And that's the most standard. If you really need a really thin board or a lighter weight, then you may go a, a thinner board, or if you have a really large board or need it to be really strong, then you may go with a thicker board. And then we just have the number of layers two, four, six, eight, those are the most common that you're gonna use. Anything above 10 gets to be really complicated. Next, you're gonna select the material, and this is the base material that's used between the routing layers of the board, and FR4 is by far the most common. The FR stands for flame retardant. The TG is the glass transition temperature. This is the temperature at which the glass of the base material transitions from being rigid to more rubbery. You want to make sure under all cases that it never, that the material never sees above the temperature that it's rated for. For a lot of designs, you can just go with TG140, but for if it's really high temperature or in other cases, you may want to go with a higher temperature one, but that's going to add some extra cost. Then as I mentioned for PCB Way, there are other base materials. FR4 is going to be the best choice for most cases. If you have an RF design, then you'll want to look at Rogers materials, which they don't list specifically here. You have to go under other, and then you'll have to add that in the notes that you want to use a Rogers based material. And then they also, they don't, unlike PCB Way, they don't offer an option for doing any type of metal core material like copper or aluminum, which I had mentioned is used to improve heat transfer or power dissipation. That isn't listed here. Number of designs. This is the number of designs that will be on a panel. As I mentioned with the PCB way lessons that PCBs are generally produced as panels instead of individual boards. And in those panels, you could either have 
10 copies of the same board or you could have five copies of each of two different boards. But it just adds more logistical issues that they have to manage to keep all these parts separated on a panel. If you're going to have more than one design per panel, then you're going to, there's going to be an additional cost. Although it still will be cheaper than ordering each board completely separate. Then we have the solder mask, which as I had explained, is just a protective layer that prevents corrosion on any of the copper traces and it also prevents solder bridges between adjacent pads that you're soldering. That's the purpose of solder mask. It's almost by far the most common color is green. That's why most of the boards are green, but you can choose other colors. Some of these colors are no additional cost, but other colors will probably have a, an additional cost. Then the silk screen is the layer that shows all of your text and drawing simple drawings and such on the outer layers of the board you can pick that color the surface finish this is the protective coating that's done on the exposed copper this is pads that will be soldered to and this prevents a, a corrosion on those pads in the past hassle was by far the most common although the initial original hassle was had lead now they have a lead free version because so much of everything is moving to lead free if you want to be rohs compliant you need to be lead free i would recommend that you use gold immersion also you'll see this labeled as e n i g all caps and that's the most that's currently the most common surface finish to use that's also that's lead free and it tends to be the same cost uh, they even say that here there's no cost but difference between the hassle lead free and the gold immersion go with the gold immersion uh, silver immersion is another lead free option that i've used in some cases but typically gold immersion is going to be your best choice copper weight this is the actually it's well it's the weight of copper but it's also the thickness of the copper this is the weight of copper spread over one square foot so one ounce will give you a specific i believe it's 1.4 mils of thickness because you're saying this is the weight of copper spread over one square foot from that can be translated into a thickness this is determining the thickness of all of your copper routing if you have a high power design, you're going to want a thicker copper so that you don't have to have your traces quite as wide. If you don't really have any high power, everything's low current, then you could go with a lower copper weight. Impedance control is something mainly used for more complex designs like a complex high speed microprocessor design. Anything that's really high frequency, hundreds of megahertz or gigahertz, this may be something you'll need is impedance control. And that just is where during the manufacturing process, they tightly monitor the impedance of various lines in the design to make sure that the impedance stays within a certain target range. Those are all of the, the basic PCB specifications. Then they have advanced specs. And this is still all that we're looking at right now. It's just for the PCB fabrication, not the assembly. That's on a, that's on a separate page. I'll run through these blind and buried vias. We already discussed those are going to be really expensive and not something you normally want it to use uh, unless a small size is really critical. Most vias are going to be through vias, which go through all layers versus blind vias and buried vias only go through part of the board. So it adds a lot of extra complexity. Via in pad. Normally you can't have a via in a pad because the via hole will wick away solder from that pad and can cause you to have a bad solder connection. So if you have via in pads, which can be common for BGA packages, then you need to select this and those vias are basically plugged and capped and plated so that they can't wick away solder from the pad during the assembly process. Then we have the minimum trace width and spacing. This is pretty self-explanatory. We've already went through this. One difference you'll see is that Bidley only offers down to four mil as their minimum width, trace width and spacing versus PCB way it could go down to three. Typically, I recommend that you stay four, between four and six. Three would be pretty extreme and only when absolutely necessary. Here, they, they specify an inspection, pro, uh, an inspection standard. For most designs, you're going to want to do class two. Class three is mainly reserved for 
products that have high reliability or high reliability requirements. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. Then we have gold fingers and gold fingers are just an, if your board has an edge connector, then you're going to want those plated with gold to, so you have a, you keep a good electrical contact and it's plated gold. So it has, it's really resistant to abrasion from connecting and disconnecting. Then you can choose a solder mask. Is it going to be on one side or both sides? Silk screen, one side or both sides. So if you're only putting units or components on one side of your board, then these will be one side. If you're putting, if you're having components mounted on both sides of the board to keep the board size smaller, then these will be typically on both sides you'll select. Then you have the option for a custom stack up. This is how the layers are stacked up. Yeah, you can do a custom option. Skip V scoring is a method of separating the panels or the individual PCBs on a panel. A, a V score is essentially, it's just a cut that they do basically, and, and it looks like a V. They, they cut down about a, a third of the way on one side, a third of the way on the bottom side. So you just have that third in the middle. It's like a perforation. And that's how you can break the boards apart. If you select, if you're ordering panels and you skip this, then that would skip that B scoring process. Then you have half cut castellated holes that we had already looked at. Those are mainly used on modules that will then attach to another printed circuit board. Edge plating, this is where you can have plating done along an edge of the printed circuit board. And that's not really something I've used before. Then you have counter sinks and counter bores. Those are just drilling methods that allow you to have a fastener, for instance, a bolt or a screw that holds your PCB, but the head of that fastener, the head of the bolt or the screw recesses partway down to the board. So it creates a flush layer at the very top. So that's just a counter sinks and counter bores is a very common term in any type of mechanical design. Then date. Code marking is you can just have the date stamped on your PCB of when it was manufactured. You can also have the UL marking because boards are flame retardant and they have a UL 94V-0 certification. You can have that printed on your board if you wanted. And then silkscreen clipping is... The silk screen is the layer that has your text and simple drawings and such. And if that overlaps, let's say you have text on your board that you've designed on the silk screen, but it, then it overlaps on top of a pad, you can select to have that automatically clipped so you're not trying to silk screen on top of a pad. In general, I recommend that you go through the PCB and your software, and it should allow you, you to do a check to make sure that none of your silk screen is overlaying any pads or anything like that. And then that way you don't, this won't be an issue once you actually go to generate your boards. Okay, those are all the specifications for the bare printed circuit board. Now I'm gonna go and we're gonna look at the assembly specs. Okay, these are the assembly specs. It's telling me it's not going to let me actually save or go through any of these until I've entered, uploaded the BOM, but I've just skipped over that just to, to show you the specifications. That's the main thing I wanted to show you and not how to upload a file. Here are all the assembly specs. We have the number of SMT pads. And if you recall, for PCB Way, they asked for the number of SMT parts and not the number of pads. Just keep that in mind. I find this being more common than the number of pads because a capacitor, a surface mount capacitor has two pads versus a surface mount chip can have dozens or hundreds of pins or pads. So it can vary a lot. This seems to make a little more sense and be a little more common is to specify the number of pads. Then you have also the number of through holes. And as I mentioned, through holes are typically not something I recommend for most components anymore. It's mainly for DIY makers that want to assemble their own boards will use through hole components. The one exception being like a connector that's going to experience a lot of force from being connected and disconnected. Uh, having a through hole connector can give you a, a more solid physical connection. Then you're going to select, are you going to have double sided 
assembly? Are you going to have surface mount components on both sides of the board? Yes or no? Do you want to use lead free solder? If you're, I highly recommend that you do just for your own health. If you're going to work on this board, breathing in lead is not good. It's also better for the environment. And then if you're going to sell your product in the EU or California or other markets, then you're going to need ROHS certification, which requires it be lead free. And this is asking for the number of components that are in a certain type of package, like a BGA package, which is a ball grid array. And they're a package that has just all the pins underneath the part in a grid that can't be seen visibly once it's attached because the pins don't extend out beyond the package. LGA is another one. WLCSP is wafer level chip scale packaging. And that's essentially a die that has very minimal, almost no package. But so those are special components that typically have really fine pitches and require a little bit of special care. That's why they want to know the number of those. Then we have QFN and DFN and SON. Those are different types of packages also that are just leadless. They're not like a ball grid array, but all the pins are still along the perimeter, but they're underneath the package. Once again, they're not, they don't have leads that extend out like some other packages. These are leadless components is what they're asking here. And these are pretty standard. Any PCB assembly shop I've ever used always wants to know the number of these two components. And then they're asking the smallest package, and these are for your passives, mainly resistors and capacitors. And these are just standard numbers that are just, these are standardized classifications for different sizes of surface mount components. By far, probably the most common is like an 0603, 0805s are also very common. Those are pretty small. The smallest I would recommend that you go is an 0402. If you go down to 0201, I would only do that if you absolutely, absolutely are trying to squeeze every little bit of space out of your board and keep the board as small as possible. Mainly just because 0201, they're so small. If you drop one or whatever, you'll never be able to find it. They're just, they're a pain to, to deal with. So only use those if you absolutely need to. And then 1206 is bigger and then it goes beyond that, but they're just asking you for the smallest. 1206 would be pretty, uh, pretty big to be your smallest choice. So in most cases, you're going to do 0805, 0603, or 0402. And then here they're asking for the inspection standard, and this is for the assembly process. Previously, they were asking the inspection standard for the PCB fabrication process. And then they want to know how many uh, boards you want. They want to know what's the total number of parts that are on the board. So this is the, not the total unique parts, but the total. So if you have five capacitors that are all identical, you would count that as five, not as one. Now, BOM lines, these are unique components. And you'll see it either asked as the number of unique components or the BOM lines. Since in a BOM, you only, each line is a unique component because if you have five capacitors, you list that on one line and you just put a quantity of five. This is wanting to know the number of unique components. So if you have those five identical capacitors, that would just count as one versus up here for all parts, that's the total number. And if you have five capacitors that are identical, you would count that as five. Okay, that is it. We've looked at both the PCB specs and the assembly specs. Okay, in this video, I've showed you how to order custom printed circuit boards. And although the specs may be slightly different between various vendors, what you've learned today will allow you to order boards from any vendor. I'm John Till with Predictable Designs. I hope you have found this video helpful and I hope you have a great day. Hey there, this is John Till, founder of Predictable Designs. If you enjoyed this video and you want to keep learning more about developing, manufacturing, and selling new hardware products, then be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also check out the websites predictabledesigns.com and thehardwareacademy.com.